A second area, I believe, is energy manipulation. Uh, in large measure, I believe, through our own doing, our great country has found itself uh, large uh, on the part of the Iranians. They say, let's keep prices high because it will have adverse impact in certain other countries in the world. Uh, the Saudis are saying that, well, let's keep prices just below the tolerance level. And that way, there will be no desire to develop alternative fuel means. And oil will continue to be king. Now, that is all lose-lose for the United States. Uh, but the fact is that uh, we are at the end of that string, and that string is being jerked. Uh, and there is concern that should there be retaliation uh, for uh, sanctions that are being laid, should there be a reaction to potentially another Israeli Hezbollah uh, breakout uh, or dust-up? Uh, should the Saudi oil fields be attacked again? They have been attacked once. We believe it was al-Qaeda. Uh, but should there be any disruption of, uh, of the significant oil supply, uh, not only for us, but, but as importantly for the rest of the world? You can see the impact that it would have on our economy, which represents a vital national interest in my mind and we could be compelled to, to act. Uh, the, the oil market is not a free market. Uh, it is controlled by nations that don't always want to uh, uh, agree with the things that we do. And, and in that regard, we are certainly vulnerable. There was a, uh, a, a secret cable that has been declassified, sent in 2008 from our embassy in Saudi Arabia. I'll read it to you. The continuing vulnerability of Saudi Arabia's strategic oil and gas production facilities represents an Achilles heel for U.S. strategic interest in the kingdom and throughout the Gulf region, not to mention U.S. economic security in general. The cable concluded, in the estimation of the MOI, the Ministry of the Interior, these facilities face a serious threat from both al-Qaeda and Iran. Perhaps, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the most troubling uh, potential for conflict uh, is the persistent course that Iran has taken on the development of, of nuclear power. Uh, they would call it nuclear power. I think we would call it nuclear weaponry. Clearly, there is no need in Iran uh, for nuclear power to provide energy. Uh, they have the second uh, largest amount of natural resource in the whole world. There are generations upon generations of, of power capability uh, in Iran, uh, cheap power. Uh, and so the, the, the supposed need for nuclear power is, is questionable at best. The rest of the region is watching. Uh, Saudi Arabia will not stand by. Questionably, Turkey uh, will not uh, stand by without some thought towards proliferation. Perhaps even Iraq in the long term. Iraq will one day be a rich country. And uh, depending upon how uh, situations evolve there, you could see uh, much more extensive use of, of, of nuclear kinds of capabilities uh, in the region. From a U.S. perspective, uh, President-elect Obama has said that uh, it is unacceptable for Iran to have nuclear weapons. Now, he has not uttered those words as our president, but I think it's fair to say that every aspect of our national policy towards the development of those weapons points towards that thought process. And so again, I, I offer the fact that, uh, that our nations, uh, in very short order, could be on, on collision course. From a strategic perspective, uh, there are not a lot of good options here. Uh, the United States is unlikely to gain an international mandate for action. Uh, America will be seen potentially as attacking yet another Middle East nation. In summary, uh, what are the uh, probabilities for these types of confrontations? Well, I would put miscalculation on a scale of 10, probably at a 5. Uh, I would put energy manipulation probably about a 4, but folks, I put the problems and the issues that we could have vis-a-vis -vis this nuclear development on a, on a scale of 10 at an 8. I think uh, within the next couple of years, unless something happens differently from, from how we are responding today, uh, Iran, as you know it, uh, could be very different uh, if indeed there is conflict uh, with, with, with our great nation. Uh, so again, I endorse the third option. Uh, and I, I hope I inject in you a, a bit of a sense of urgency that sooner is better in terms of whatever influences uh, can be manifested uh, to try to, to make a difference. 
Let me, if I can, as a, as, as a final comment, uh, just speak for a moment about the MEK and, and Camp Arishoff and, and my own observations and experiences. Uh, I, I guess I'm the only uh, member of the panel that may have had uh, physical responsibilities for their security. Uh, and I'll, I'll go back with you and tell you that uh, in 2004, when my expeditionary force went back into Iraq, uh, we went into uh, the western province uh, and had responsibility for securing uh, a couple of, uh, of elements of MEK that were first around Fallujah and then relocated down southwest of a place we call Takata. I asked my superior, what kind, of, what kind of bag of worms are you handing me here? Uh, our job is tough enough to have a, quote, terrorist group in our midst is something that uh, you know, I was not prepared to, uh, to, to take aboard. But uh, as I dispatched some of my commanders uh, to sit down and, and, and talk with these folks, as I visited myself, uh, these people are not terrorists. They're more terrorists than, than the people here on the path. Um, <laughs> There was an obvious contradiction. On the one hand, we knew they had been listed by our State Department, and I have tremendous confidence in our State Department. On the other hand, uh, we were told, and, and, and the, the, the mission remained for five years in Iraq, uh, to provide them security. Uh, it, it made no sense. If they're terrorists, we ought to be arresting them and investigating them and making sure that they receive their just dues. Uh, we asked those people to disarm. They're the only people in Iraq who are disarmed. Okay. A decision was made early on by Ambassador Bremer that it was okay for an Iraqi to have his, okay, his, his AK in the closet. And yet these people complied willingly uh, and have done what we asked them to do. Now, it seems to me the, the press of events and, and other members of the panel have played them out, I think, very nicely, are such today that we have got to reconsider uh, our national posture uh, towards the people at Camp Arishaf and, and the MEK in general. Uh, I read, as, as I did my homework, that the French have come back and said our initial investigation was flawed. There is no basis for, for the entirety of the claim. Our good friends in Europe, as has been enunciated again, the UK and the UE, uh, EU, are encouraging us uh, to alter our policy. And I, I've got to tell you, um, what happened uh, recently should be a national outrage. And, and unfortunately, I, I don't see it. Uh, let, let me drop back. Uh, when, when I train Marine lieutenants as, as a young captain, our guidance to them is if you are working as an advisor to a foreign unit and there is about to be a violation of, of, of human rights, there's about to be an atrocity, try to stop it. Okay? If you can't stop it, then you walk away from it because you do not want to be a part of it but you immediately report it, and then you do something about it. Now, if you elevate that simple tactical lesson to nations, then there's something missing here, okay? The incident has occurred, and now there's a responsibility on the part of our nation, I believe, to demand investigation and find out who are the culpable parties. I honestly think that needs to be the next step in this affair because, as has been emphasized, we are the United States of America. We have values. We stand for something. And I think that uh, there is a moral imperative here uh, to make this situation right. And, and I think from a, uh, from a moral perspective, and arguably even from a legal perspective, we have lawyers on the panel, I should let them talk about that. Uh, we bear a responsibility. As long as there are troops in Iraq, U.S. troops in Iraq, we bear a responsibility for what has happened and what should happen in the future. Uh, let, me, uh, let me just finish by saying, though, ladies and gentlemen, after that is done, and that's got to be your 25-meter your target, your 100-meter target has to be uh, influencing that regime in some way, any way you can, to avoid this collision course that we see today. Uh, the last person that wants to go to war is a general. And I'll, I'll, I'll swear to you today uh, that we simply don't need to see this happen. Uh, but inevitably it will, unless something is done. Thank you all for the war. This is also my first time 
addressing uh, this group, and I very humbly join a group of very distinguished leaders and experts who offer you far more in this dialogue of U.S.-Iranian relations than I do. It's so hard for many Americans to appreciate the freedoms we have, and it's easy to take these liberties for granted when that's all you've ever known. We have an obligation to teach new generations of Americans about the value of our civic institutions and how we are so blessed to live on the right side of history. It's also important to teach them we have a moral obligation to stand with those who are still seeking freedom. When Iran's opposition movement brought millions of Iranians to the streets in the summer of 2009, demanding a free and fair vote in the presidential elections, the Iranian regime did not count on, nor did they care about, the world seeing the images of innocent, nonviolent protesters suffocated by the massive security presence in those streets, willing to use violence on its own people. Half of Iran's 70 million people are under 30, and half of the population are women. Over the last six months, the winds of change have arrived in the Arab region, and there too, it is the women and youth who are leading these movements. Repressive regimes like Iran, I don't have to tell you, survive on brutal tactics. But we have seen they collapse the instant their people cease to be fearful of speaking out. We need to put a spotlight on the leaders of this new wave of freedom and show how social media helps spark events in the Middle East. We need to draw lessons that could be applied to spreading freedom in other oppressed lands. This new generation understands the need for political diversity and economic opportunity, and they understand the role of social media and how it allows voices, all voices, to be heard. 60% of Iran's 3.5 million university students are women. Women have had a long history in Iran of being very strong activists and an important standard by which the progress of a society can be measured is the women's status in that society. The main impediment to any progress or success in Iran is the difficult, suspicious regime that refuses any democratic reforms. Iran was hijacked by extremist leaders with extremist ideologies that isolated their citizens, turned neighboring countries into enemies, and continue to destabilize the region and the world. We have to continue to use sanctions, spotlight regime abuses, and understand the leverage points that undermine authoritarian regimes, such as military loyalty, nonviolent resistance, social media, and economic decline. The economic crisis is getting worse every day. Why should the citizens of a country so rich in gas and oil be facing this kind of hopelessness? Targeted sanctions should be imposed, and they should be tied directly to human rights. In the fledgling democracies in the region, we have to strengthen prospects for success by deepening commitments to ideas and policies favorable to freedom. None of this strong action or support is possible until we first revitalize the American commitment to fostering democracy and supporting freedom advocates around the world. That is what your message should be to our leaders. The United States has powerful tools in our vast arsenal of diplomacy. And my hope is that they will one day be deployed to help a free and democratic Iran rebuild into the country you all want and we want for you. Thank you.